before we start, though, do let me tell you, you know what? Yeah. Um, Because sometimes I have to tell interviewers, um, there's nothing out of bounds. So please, under no circumstances, are you to say, well, I just thought of a really good question that might be a little edgy, but I dare not ask because the next time that he goes on camera, he'll destroy my reputation and ask the president to remove me from the campus. I won't do that. Hmm. There's no rules. Because if it's something I don't want to answer, like where I live (laughs) or what my social security number is, I just won't answer. Or I will say something frivolous. Sounds good. Besides, I only need to ask my dad where you live anyways. <laughs> well, I can always, of course, have my attorney answer that. <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, without further ado, here we go. Hello, Pat. So, so good to finally meet you in person. Yeah, I, I'm a little disappointed that you, thank you very much, me too. Uh, I'm a little disappointed that you cut the music out because that was cooking. That was, who was that? Um, that was uh, <laughs> a uh, free music that I found online. <laughs> so uh, as much as I wish that I was the own, my own musician, I, I uh, was not. What a great name for a group. Exactly. Free music I found online. Yeah, they have a special coming out next year. Well, you don't have to have one of those expensive contracts that says yeah. that you can have the rights to the yeah. to the music that you play. Uh, let's wait until I get out of debt with all of this equipment before I... <laughs> now, will, will the administration uh, have this accessible to them? For example, the president of Grand Canyon... Uh, and the treasurer, do they know that you are a debtor? Uh, no, I am actually not in debt. But for this project, <laughs> I am glad to announce that uh, I am uh, I am I am good with my dues. This is this is really starting off hot, isn't it? Oh Christian? yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep that under. I'm, I'm, I'll cut that out later. Yeah, when do you introduce me to the people who just moved here who have absolutely no idea who you're talking to? Well, uh, I would ask the same questions to myself because I have no idea. No, I, I'm I'm joking. Oh, no. oh, oh, it's going to be <laughs> one of those, huh? Oh, yes. Um, Pat McMahon, a, you are a very accomplished radio and TV personnel. You've been on multiple shows airing your own as well and being part of both theatric and news source material. Thank you for not using terms like legend and icon, which are all simply other ways of saying geezer. (laughs) Icon is Greek for geezer. Did you know that? I did not. Look it up, please. All right, I will. The language department at GCU will be proud. Yes. I will. Um, so before all the um, f- all the nitty gritty, how would At you? At these prices, you only get the nitty. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Totally. No, if if we had an arrangement with a, a talent fee and uh, a, a fee for every time this is played, then you would also get the, the nitty, gritty. the nitty and the gritty. Yes, absolutely. How would you describe your day in a weather forecast thus far? Uh, (laughs) How would I describe my day in a weather forecast? Yes. So rather than how do you feel, how would you describe it in a weather forecast? Oh, uh, bright, sunny, clear, and welcome in residences 
and automobiles across the state of Arizona. Convertible kind of weather. Oh, absolutely. And I'm a convertible kind of guest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'm glad that's, to hear that's, that. That's a, uh, that's a question I've never been asked in that form, and I hope you never do it again. But uh, it goes back to a period of time dating himself. You just reminded me how long it's been since I have done weather on television. I was one of those guys at Channel 5 in 1960, 61. And I remember seeing the publicity picture of me standing in front of a map. Now, you have to understand, Christian, this is a map that was painted on a wall. Mm -hmm. There was no electronic map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a map of the United States, and then we would slide this map away, uh, physically, actually, slide it on little wheels, and then there would be the state of Arizona. And the, t the temperatures, the, the states weren't listed or anything like that, but the, uh, we would... We would write the temperatures in chalk because they were slates where the maps were. Uh, I believe this goes back to the days of pterodactyls and brontosauruses. Yeah, roughly. And and those were uh, the station pets uh, that we just used to have for, for company. But truly, that was when I did the weather uh, and uh, and that's how successful weather forecasting was yeah. in those days. Yeah. So so needless to say, you've been in the you've been in front of a camera for quite some time. Many many years, and how fortunate I am mm -hmm. that people still welcome me into their homes and on radio into their cars and now onto their computers and various uh, items of electronica. Yeah. Now, uh, expounding in uh, for, forms of medium, not not just the television anymore as well. Yeah. Yeah. And now on YouTube and now on podcasts. And now on this podcast. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's very interesting that you go to uh, Grand Canyon University that proudly refers to itself in all of its marketing as a Christian university. Mm-hmm. And you've taken complete credit for that, saying that they have asked permission to use your name. Yeah, yeah. I, I, get, a, I, get, a, I get a short percentage of fee. Why uh, is it that with for, me as a guest, you were obligated in the first few minutes to use the term short? Was there, was there a, a subtle reference to my diminutive size? Well... Like, according to psychology, like, sometimes things just occur because of uh, uh, influences that we get. In my, in my own opinion, it's a, a visual perception that may have slip of the tongue uh, come out as a, um, as a descriptive part uh, that may or may not be, according to this scenario, true. And is that why it is that when I met you, you said, welcome to Lilypot? Yes, uh, that. I'm not familiar with that reference. <laughs> Jonathan Swift and the Lilliputians is oh, perfectly all right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wonder if the audience so far considers themselves to be thoroughly entertained and involved in this conversation. As much as we are. Yes. Oh, I, I, I am. I'm fascinated <laughs> because this is about me. Yeah, exactly. Um, so a brief call on history. Um, you were on the Wallace and Ladmo show, which was the longest and latest running daily kids show in history. You among. Yeah, it was, it was actually, <clears throat> it was actually the longest running, uh, local television show, daily show mm -hmm. with the same cast. Uh, of any kind, yeah. uh, kids shows, anything. Uh, there have been uh, some uh, uh, 
daytime dramas mm-hmm. uh, that have now been around for 40 years. We only made it to 36. Yes. But it was, it was the same cast. Mm-hmm. 36 shows, 10,000 shows, which is still stunning to me in a business where your career can be a week and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, the career, by the way, I remind you that you've chosen to do <laughs> because of the security that you found. Mm-hmm. But um, I, no, I, I'm the new guy on the show. Wallace and Ladmo started in 1954 uh, and uh, went on until the first day of 1990. Uh, and, and I can't believe that with the recognition that it still gets, uh, that it that makes it 31 years old mm-hmm. uh, this year. And there's no day that goes by, Christian, that I am not told a heartbreaking story from someone who was sitting in the wrong seat at the wrong time when the winner was announced and it was another kid who won a Ladmo bag. Ladmo bag, yeah. Every day, every day, people will tell me something that has put them into therapy for all of this time. Uh, have you met anybody that did win a Ladmo bag? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Because we, the, we gave away thousands upon thousands <laughs> of them. Yeah. But because, because it was a very special prize, everybody in the audience didn't get one. I yeah. mean, you had to win one because your name was drawn or because... Uh, we, uh, we chose your, seat. your cartoon, oh. uh, or the winning seat at a personal appearance. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, the saddest story was when a kid was sitting, waiting for the show to start at the state fair or in the studio or the Fox Chris town theater, one of our regular, mm-hmm. uh, appearance places. And, um, uh, and the kid had to go to the bathroom or he went out to get popcorn or oh, something. No. And he came back and another kid was sitting in the seat. So he sat over there and that kid won the Ladmo bag. That was the seat that was chosen. Oh. Well, you <laughs> no, you talk about frontal lobes all of a sudden. Yeah. A surgery, fr- frontal lobectomy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the second saddest Ladmo bag story is when this kid didn't get his name uh, drawn out of the big, huge revolving tub of postcards. Uh, But his sister did. No, I didn't win, but this is what I hear. Yeah. No. No, Pat. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they start giving you this. Like like it was your fault. It's your fault. <laughs> no, I didn't win a Landmo bag. But, and then you know what's coming. My sister did. Yeah. I mean, it's broken up families, Christian. Yeah, yeah. And you know what a Landmo bag consisted of? No, Pat, please tell me now. <laughs> it was a Bash's grocery bag. Filled with sponsors' products, Hostess cupcakes, Twinkies, animal crackers, all the stuff that kept orthodontists in business. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter. You had a picture of the three of us and Ladmo's name on the outside of the bag. Oh, bigger than a Krugerrand. Yeah. Oh, no. They're still asking for him. Well, you could you could debate on saying that because they come up to you telling you how they didn't get it, you could, in response, say that they got a Gerald bag instead, which include nothing. No, a Gerald bag actually was mentioned every it once was. in a while by Gerald, who was the little Lord Fauntleroy brat, uh, valueless, played, played by terrible child. Yeah, uh, he was a twelve-year-old that uh, uh, lied and cheated. Oh, and it was the greatest character in the world. Oh, yeah. Because the kids hated him as well they should mm-hmm. if it was a kid who did all those rotten things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we never pretended to be Mr. Rogers teaching the value of 
being a quality human being. Mm -hmm. We were a totally vaginalist show. <laughs> but if you happen to pick up something, because Gerald was such a villain and the kids hated him so much, uh, it was just like the world wrestling. Yeah. The bad guy and the good guy. The good guy was Ladmo. Yeah. And he was a real good guy. But Gerald, uh, yeah, Gerald announced that he had a uh, a bag. And I, in the bag, uh, instead of Twinkies and potato chips, uh, broccoli, uh, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, and kale. <laughs> Things that were good for you. Yeah, would make a vegan kid very happy. <laughs> yes, absolutely. What else would you like to know about a show Well, just that, a, that, that was off <laughs> before your parents even got married? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah my, uh, uh, just another note that I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I saw a testimonial of uh, one of the, um, by one of the women that was uh, uh, with the show, and she said... Um, uh, years ago, her mom wrote a letter saying how her, she didn't want her daughter to watch the show because it was too crude. And then come to find out, she later becomes one of the uh, main actresses that uh, was playing with Well, it would have had group. to have been uh, Kathy and, Dressbach because... I, I believe so. Well, because the only other women on the show were me. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I also played... Uh, Aunt Maud, an elderly mm -hmm. woman yeah. uh, who had questionable uh, stories, valuables and stories. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, Kathy, local actress, mm -hmm. uh, probably the show had been on for, I guess, maybe 25, 26, 27 years. And she was a an improvisational comic mm -hmm. with an improv group in town. And uh, the group came on and did a couple of guest appearances, but she just knocked us out. Mm -hmm. And besides that, she wrote comedy. So she created uh, some terrific characters. This was the first, and I believe the only actual female that we ever had on the show. She was, she was sensational. I don't remember the story about her mom, but it sounds... Like something that probably would have broken up a family sometime <laughs> in the past. Oh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, since there aren't any commercial breaks, right? Yep. Uh, so it doesn't matter how many times I interrupt. Apparently not. <laughs> uh, no, you just reminded me about a mom that was offended by what she considered to be crude comedy. I, I don't think it's applicable because I don't know that we ever set out to be crude. Yeah. But um, uh, it was edgy. Mm -hmm. uh, Saturday Night Live for Kids. Uh, sketch comedy. But when someone would write in a letter of complaint, and they didn't happen often, but somebody would come from uh, Pittsburgh or somebody would come from Fresno and they grew up with Captain Kangaroo mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Rogers. Really nice, sweet shows, right? They didn't pretend to be a, a comedy show. Yeah. We didn't pretend to be sweet. <laughs> and... So when someone would write to management, one of my favorite things about the show, the general manager who was accruing so much revenue from the Wallace and Ladmo show and such ratings that he wouldn't have come in and told us that he was upset because a viewer wrote a complaint. Mm -hmm. uh, he knew that we weren't doing anything that would be offensive uh, other than to that one person. So he would bring the letter in, hand it to Wallace and say, 
I promised this viewer I would give you the letter. Wallace would read it. And then immediately that day would announce the crank letter of the week contest. <laughs> instead of, instead of apologizing yeah. or ignoring it, he would write two other critical letters from phony yeah, yeah, yeah. people. And he would have the three letters there, including the real one, would read all three, <laughs> terribly critical of the show, <laughs> and then have the audience vote on which letter was the crank letter of the week. Well, we always made sure that it was the one that was real. Mm -hmm. And he would say, Mrs. Farnsworthy, I thank you very much. Uh, penmanship was marvelous. And we want you to come down to the show because you are the winner of the Crank Letter of the Week and you get a Ladmo bag. And Christian, they always came. This is somebody who wrote to the manager <laughs> about how she would never let her children watch the show again. They always came. And every once in a while, as they were being interviewed by Wallace, they made sure that it was clear that they were there for the prize because they would say, well, I am getting a Lanmo back. <laughs> 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 That's the mood of the show anyway. Yeah. And for those who have never seen the show, because 31 years ago, the last, the last of the 10,000 shows aired, it's on YouTube mm -hmm. and uh, it's around yeah. forever. And I loved it. Oh, yeah. You mentioned Gerald. I mentioned Aunt Maud. Uh, there were over a hundred different characters, someone told me. Mm -hmm. But we must acknowledge in these days when politics runs the show on the news is almost always one of the lead stories, usually by someone who has been in office for a while and really takes himself far too seriously. Captain Super, mm -hmm. the phoniest comic book hero yeah. in the history of non-heroes because he never did anything heroic. Just the big empty promises. Wait a minute, hold it. My father voted for him, I think. That's what kids would say. So all of these characters came out of real life. Hmm. Yeah, uh, which is super cool. And like, yeah, like, like how you mentioned that there's still a big following of people that still love it. Like I was scrolling through YouTube and watching things for, and people are still commenting. Uh, oh, yeah. people, still, people still talking about how they loved it, how they still want to Isn't keep watching great? it. Oh yeah, it, that's awesome. This is it's a, a timeless business. Thing. This, well, this is a business uh, where... Uh, no matter how successful you are as an anchor man mm. or a weather man or uh, any kind of a personality, radio or television, um, if you're off the air because you go to hack and sack because it's a better job, mm -hmm. um, after about six weeks, most, the very peak six weeks, People refer to you as, what's his name? The guy with the, and then they will describe some facial feature of something. Yeah. They don't remember your name. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that's just part of the business. Somebody else takes your place. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, Wallace and Ladmo has made its mark in this town. Oh, got time for another story? Yes, Pat, certainly. Please, oh, of course. All the time in the world. Um, see, I don't need a host. Because... <laughs> oh, yeah. No, this, this I didn't bring anything prepared. I was just waiting for you. <laughs> well, neither did I. Uh, no, I'm just reminded yeah. uh, about stories that, uh, for the most part, I haven't told. But I was thinking, legendary show that, Generations grew up with in Arizona. Mm -hmm. 
Well, there was a period of time when we were on in New York. New York found out about us and the advertising agency said, wait a minute, are you kidding? Look at how much product these guys sell. An advertiser comes on and all of a sudden goes crazy. Kids having their moms and dads go to the store and buy that product, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Because the show was that popular and kids believed while in land. They were... They were people that they that they trusted, even though they were funny guys. So, uh, Channel Five in New York has us tape a, a show because we we wouldn't have set our show since there were so many local references. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we would tape a show with our bits but without a reference to Arizona, just for WPIX in New York. Sophisticated, extraordinarily hip, media savvy, New York City, the Big Apple. We were on for two weeks and the program director calls Wallace and says, uh, listen, while... No offense, but could you make Gerald a little nicer? We've been getting complaints. P people in New York were used to, mm -hmm. hello, boys and girls, yeah. brush your teeth mm -hmm. three times a day, and then I will love you. And it would be somebody in a sailor hat or a space suit or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Wallace said, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, he's rotten. He's a rotten kid. He's the villain. What? How would we explain to our audience that suddenly Gerald began to understand the values that Ladmo provided? <laughs> so I think we lasted two or three months. Mm -hmm. And they finally said, no, no. <laughs> It's not a kid's show that we uh, we really had in mind. Yeah. Sophisticated, mm -hmm. media savvy New York. A couple of years later, Channel 5, coincidentally, having nothing to do with Channel 5 here, in Los Angeles, they called and they found out about us... Uh, from some other source, looked at the numbers, looked at the ratings and so on. So we got to get these guys on. So a station owned by Gene Autry, the Western star. And they flew us over and we had a long meeting and it was terrific. And we even tried to explain the show. I mean, they had seen videos of the show. This was not a, a huge shock surprise. And, uh, but apparently they thought, well, how we could adjust the show for sophisticated Los Angeles, mm -hmm. media savvy, motion picture capital of the world. This time it was about three weeks and the program director called Wallace and said, Wow, could you make Captain Super a little less political? We're getting complaints. <laughs> and we said, that's who the guy is. He's everybody's Uncle Waldo who comes over on holidays and promises the kids at 20, but he didn't bring any cash with him. <laughs> He's every phony baloney, a big a uh, uh, big talk, no action guy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's what a lot of people are when they decide to run for office. I think we lasted two more months and we loved it because we wouldn't change the show. Yeah. Not even for New York and LA. Yeah. That's, and I'm glad. I'm glad we did. Oh, yeah. That, that's super cool. Um, 
So you've been in. Super cool would not be a reference to that Captain Super. There was nothing cool about it. It was Captain Cool. Uh, No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) This is the humor part. (laughs) For people who don't really know about Captain Super, here was a feat of strength. He would come in and announce to the audience in Wallace and Landmo that today he would put away the critics by tearing a phone book in half. Truly a feat of strength that would be talked about Mm -hmm. by bodybuilders for years to come. The, The phone book was from Heber, Arizona. It was the Heber phone book with one yellow page. And he still struggled. (laughs) That was Captain Super. So you've been in weather forecasting, (laughs) radio. You are the the greatest weather forecaster Arizona has ever seen. Oh, are you kidding? (laughs) Dewey Hopper will never forgive you. Uh, 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 No, I think I did weather for a a year or something like that. When Channel 5 hired me, I was kind of coming through. Mm -hmm. I had just been in the Army, came down to enjoy May in Phoenix, get the khaki off, jump in a pool, and then I was going to New York. But I fell in love with this town. Mm -hmm. Sent my resume out, got a job at Channel 5 in the news, but... I was a huge fan already of the Wallace and Landmo show just as a viewer. Yeah. Uh, I never really thought about being on. So I did the news at noon and, uh, and the weather and sports. And in those days, every, one guy did everything. Mm-hmm. But if you continue to insist that I was able to actually predict <laughs> the dew point, I never found out even what the hell that was. But the fact that you've always been in front of a camera and always been in, in front of a mic, it seems. Um, All my life, yeah. Yeah. But the question is why? Like, what, what about media, what about entertainment is something that you find passionate about? Like, um, again, coming back from the Army, uh, when you mentioned that you could have gone and just done one of those knick-knack jobs uh, that would have paid the bills. Why media and why entertainment? Because I can't do anything else. I have a total and complete failure when it comes to building, when it comes to fine art, when it comes to drywall. I don't even know why drywall is dry. Why don't, why are there not wet wall specialists? Uh, These are the questions that need to be asked on this, on this podcast. This could move you into the big time with a huge sponsor that specializes in wet wall. Do you understand that, Christian? This is a transition point in your life, a segue. And remember, I was honest enough to say, I can't do anything else. My parents were dancers. We traveled the country. I'd been in 50 states by the time I was 12. I don't know how many countries. On the road, homeschooled. Grew up in theaters, uh, auditoriums, nightclubs, and that was an idyllic life for a kid. Oh, yeah. At least for this kid. Mm -hmm. Loved it. And I was watching the comics, and I learned comedy timing Mm -hmm. from them, what was good and what was not, what material sold to the audience and what didn't. Uh, Watched... Variety acts and uh, uh, magicians. But I was the kid backstage that watched the magicians put the rabbits in their coat. Uh, You know, you got a chance to do that. And then it was on to another town. Uh, I loved show business. I was around it constantly. And then finally, when I went away to school... Uh, my parents thought that it was probably a good idea that I experienced a classroom at least for a short period of time. Yeah. Went to high school at a Catholic boys' school in Des Moines, Iowa, right in the middle of the United States. Uh, and um, 
it uh, a little like Brophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, had that experience, but I was still an actor and went out for all the school plays. And, and then one day it occurred to me, wait a minute, if I... <laughs> If I'm on television or on the radio, I can be in everybody's home entertaining them without having to pack a bag. Yeah. I love traveling when I did, mm -hmm. but I thought, this is kind of cool, actually, staying in one town. Sounds ideal. For a little bit, you yeah. know, yeah. But that's why, that's why. Never had any desire to... Uh, go into the world of science or go into the world of uh, politics or go into any other world other than that which I can do doing interviews mm -hmm. and talking to the people who have degrees yeah. and a great deal of success in those fields. That's terrific. Yeah. So to you, a lot of things came naturally and just over the course of a long period of time of just uh, not only viewing, but uh, observing and then uh, putting into practice soon after that. Everything but drywall. Everything but drywall or wet wall, as we've found out. Um, so even though that came up very naturally and things like that, um, there are many, uh, I would say a huge majority of everybody that gets into the business has not had that kind of experience and has not had those kind of things. And sometimes they may think that it may be something that they want to do or don't have the confidence to quite do that. Uh, do you have anything to say, like just for the people that um, think that the position would be amazing, think that it would be a great to do something th that you've done and that you've accomplished throughout your whole life, but don't exactly know where to start or know exactly uh, what's first steps to take, I guess. No, the starting, that's the tough part. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Getting the first job or learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you were talking about uh, that person who aspires, I'm assuming that you're talking about a career in media. Uh, I mean, as opposed to theater or the recording arts or something, because th those are very, very different. Yeah. And very different beginnings sometimes even more difficult uh, to find footing in. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't always find a place to put on a play. Yeah. Uh, or to find a place that would be interesting in hearing uh, uh, you sing. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of radio stations and a large number of television, even more now, television facilities mm. uh, or cable facilities or places to do iPods now. Uh, so much as you have, you can start your own. Mm. Difficult to do in the performing arts uh, if you don't have somebody who says, come over to my place and do that for this audience. Especially then if he also is planning on paying you yeah. to do those things. Exactly. But in media, in uh, electronics uh, and communication, uh, I was extremely fortunate, as you said, <clears throat> to have had that theatrical background as an observer, as a member of the audience, as somebody who was able to see on a daily basis people doing it well and people who were lousy and uh, the people who were lousy that didn't last. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was tremendously valuable. But when I was in high school, now that you caused me to remember a kind of a transition moment, when I was, when I was in high school, uh, there weren't really opportunities to go to see people do what I grew up with mm -hmm. uh, other than every once in a while somebody would come to town with a show. Uh, but, uh, but I could always go, I found out, 
to one of the local radio stations. And I think I just kind of fell into it one day. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in this building where the uh, Des Moines Register and Tribune was printed, the capital city of Iowa. And I was in that state because it was equidistant to wherever my parents might be in mm. their travels. And I went upstairs to the radio station and just stood on the other side of the glass and watched a guy do a talk show with local people as guests. And uh, you bring back a memory from a long time ago, but this was really a transition in my life because at one point I finally thought, you know, that's, that's a terrific way to do kind of what I grew up with because you can do a little comedy if you're funny and you can have a singer come in and you can have a band for that matter. If the studio is big enough, you could do dramatic readings if that would be of interest to the audience. And you can talk about the news and you, well, you have all the freedom in the world to do whatever it is that you want to as long as the audience wants to listen. And they don't even have to pay. Wow. And I can go into a studio every day and not be on the road not be in a strange location. What's my dressing room look like? Where's my agent sending me? No, I go there every day. That's my office and my stage. And it was really fairly sudden that that began to appeal to me. And uh, by the way, you should know that... Uh, <clears throat> While I was in high school at Dowling Prep Academy, just in case anybody happens to come from Des Moines and says, oh, I didn't know he went to school there. Um, at Drake University downtown was a broadcast student who put his way, uh, who, who paid his way through college by playing the piano in local bands and orchestras. And I found out later that he was the pianist in the band that played for my senior prom. And that guy, that piano player, Al McCoy, the voice of the Phoenix Suns, for something like 30 some years. Yeah. Yeah. We were sitting having coffee one day and we were talking about Des Moines and began to put things together. And isn't that weird? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's awesome. Well, I hope the audience thinks so. Oh, yeah. No, totally. <laughs> and if they don't, <laughs> I did. <laughs> well, this was awesome. And as much as I'd love to continue on and oh, uh, hear more stories what? and things. You're giving me the bums rush? Yes. This, the, you, have, the, you have two minutes, the yes, exits, Mr. McMahon. The exit sign? What? Is flashing. Okay, yes. well, President Mueller uh, is not even considering me for possible scholarship? Uh, I don't believe so. I believe he has a lot on his plate at this moment. <laughs> hey, congratulations, by the way. To Thank GCU you. see you go to NCAA uh, March Madness. Absolutely terrific. Uh, I'm sure he can take a crank letter if you ever want to give it to him. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this has been fun. And it's, uh, it's always great to be talking to somebody uh, about the subject that we were talking about a few minutes ago. That is aspirations and career dreams about doing something like this and being paid for it. Yeah. After you get out of school. Exactly. <clears throat>
Congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much for having us uh, and being able to use this uh, space. Um, I'll thank AZTV uh, personally. Uh, it was a really fun and, and cool experience. Did you find a lot of pressure trying to work in very short questions in between my very long answers? Uh, it was fine. <laughs> we, it, was, it, it went great. And you didn't have to work that hard. No, not really. Thanks, Christian. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And with that, thank you. Pat McMahon. Pat McMahon. <laughs>